And it's in. Bring, 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 bring. What's up, guys? It's Jason here, and welcome to my YouTube channel, Back to the 90s Insight. Remember the Furby dolls and their gigantic eyes, the Spice Girls and their gigantic hair, and Heelys? Otherwise known as the original skate shoes with wheels. Well, if you do, then you may be a 90s kid like me who grew up in the 2000s and, at the time, highly coveted these sports shoes with wheels, and sometimes with lights that blinked and flickered. I remember when everyone in school had them, and they were in every other department store. Do you? Even if you do, these days I haven't seen Heelys on any shoe store shelf or anyone even wearing them, young or old. For a rolling shoe that razzled and dazzled so many in the 2000s, what happened and where did it all go wrong? What happened to the shoes with wheels? What are the shoes with wheels called? When did the shoes with wheels become popular? By the end of this video, you'll know everything that happened behind this fad. But before we begin, if you wouldn't mind just tapping that like button for the YouTube algorithm, I would really appreciate it. The more engagement a video like this gets, the more likely the YouTube algorithm is to push it out for more people to enjoy. And as this is a brand new channel I started this year, I appreciate it a million fold. I really love all you guys and also respond to all comments and feedback. If you love things from the 90s, be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell for new videos each week. Thanks for doing that, and now let's continue on with the rise and fall of Shoes with Wheels. Inspiration Leads to Business Opportunity The idea for Heelys was actually born in 1999 by Roger Adams. Not a professional inventor or even an entrepreneur, Adams was a clinical psychologist who reportedly hated his job but loved skating. As company folklore has it, the stars seemed to be aligned in the founding of Heelys because he wore his first skates at nine months old. In fact, he even entered the Guinness Book of World Records as the youngest person to have ever skated. It's probably no wonder that his parents actually owned a skating rink while he was growing up, too. Those fond memories jogged his memory as he went through a divorce after a 21-year marriage. Adams himself told MSNBC that the idea came to him when he was on vacation at Huntington Beach in 1998, going through the proverbial bachelor house on the beach phase, watching kids going up and down the beach on their inline skates, and it reminded me of a happier time in my life. All of a sudden, he had an idea of a shoe that could roll on command by just shifting your body weight. His eureka moment made set in motion the nitty gritty of trying to bring an idea to reality, a challenge that many entrepreneurs can relate to. Adams was confident that he was onto something, but he had to convince others to believe in his idea as well because he needed to get his operation off the ground. The first steps were making a prototype and securing funding for, at the very least, a patent. Creating a working prototype wasn't too crazy for Adams because even though he didn't have experience as an entrepreneur, he was a self-declared tinkerer. Soon enough, he got started by cutting out the heels of a pair of Nike running shoes with a hot butter knife. After running a rod through the heel, he placed in wheeled bearings off of a skateboard. While he didn't succeed on the first try, most importantly, he kept trying and working and eventually came up with a prototype he can show to others, especially potential investors. It also helped that his cousin gave him the seed money to have a more polished looking prototype than the clunking Nike shoes with skateboarding bearings inserted into them. Like many entrepreneurs, Adams pitched and pitched his product. With his hard work and luck, he secured a $2.4 million investment from Capital Southwest, a venture capital firm. At the behest of Capital Southwest, Adams' newfound company needed a leader in the shoe business with a track record of success. That's where Mike Staffordoni comes in. Capital Southwest leadership tapped him to spearhead the business aspect of Heelys because he had five years of R&D at Rollerblade and had also gotten his feet wet at Keds and Converse. In other words, it was a match made in heaven. Staffaroni had experience in both skates and sneakers. He did eventually agree to join Heelys, but on a tentative six-month consulting basis initially. There seemed to be a big clash between Adams' near-term vision for the company and its potential sales and those of Staffaroni, who was far more grounded or simply skeptical, depending on whose side you're taking. Just how vast was the difference in their projections? Adams projected 70 million sales in the first year. Staffaroni projected a few years in, they could do perhaps 8 or 9 million sales. Can you guess who was more right? Debut Healy made its industry debut at the biannual Action Sports Retailer Trade Show in San Diego, which at the time was the place to be seen and heard if you were part of the sports and sport footwear industry. It just so happened that skateboarding had gotten hot at the time too, 
so Adams could have been onto something. At their booth, as soon as Stafferoni and a salesperson asked a few skaters to actually try on and demonstrate what Heelys could do, everyone at the convention took notice. Stafferoni himself seemed to change his mind when, after the demo, the Heelys booth gained a stream of orders. The sales forecast then increased to 12 million, and with a conventional post-trade show launch date of spring that year, in 2001, it was the simple case of seeing is believing, except another snafu raised its ugly head yet again. Capital Southwest had become so impressed with the trade show response to Heelys that they wanted to seize the moment. Christmas was drawing closer and they wanted to sell units during the hottest season of the year, even if it meant rushing manufacturing and shipping, as well as scrounging for retailers who would give Heelys shelf space and push the brand new product. Luckily, Heelys caught a break again because the salesperson, Gary, who had been with Stafferoni, actually worked with Journeys, the mall-based shoe retailer, and they agreed to do a test run of the product by selling them in around 20 stores. After the Christmas season, Stafferoni got the affirmation that he needed at the time. The CMO of Journeys, Peter Hick, called him directly to ask if they had any Heelys left. When Stafferoni responded that they probably had a few thousand left, Hick said, we'll take them. With that C-level affirmation from a nationwide retailer, Stafferoni was locked, loaded, and ready to become the CEO of Heelys. The Next Big Thing Heelys proved to be the next big thing from then on. Sales tripled every month for nine months. At the end of that nine months, they had managed to sell 500,000 pairs. Exclusivity was the name of the game with Stafferoni. Rather than spend a significant amount of money on traditional print advertising, he utilized the word of mouth they were already getting into shaping its image as an exclusive item that cool skaters used. The seeing is believing factor of Healy's appeal wasn't lost on Stafferoni, so the company ended up sending skaters out to stores, skate parks, and busy areas to skate around and try to attract attention of passerby. Niche online forums and frequented by skaters were also used to plug the brand and product. Given that so many younger people were interested in the product, word of mouth did spread quickly. It meant Heelys had to start spending big on television ads only beginning in 2005. Heelys continued its meteoric rise in pop culture with a few fortunate coincidences. At the same time, R&B singer Usher was dominating the radio more. He was also spotted wearing Heelys in his music video for You Don't Have to Call. Luckily for Heelys, he also wore the shoes when performing the song live at that year's Grammys. Stafferoni maintains it was not a paid endorsement, but a choice by Usher's personal shopper at Nordstrom. As Heelys continued its expansion with factories overseas in South Korea and China, in addition to their Texas headquarters, by the end of 2003, the company wanted more official endorsements and even tried to pitch the shoes to Shaq, building six pairs for him. And as we all know, Shaq has huge feet. You know what they say about large feet? Large Heelys. While attempts at official endorsements did not always go as planned, in addition to the unplanned love from Usher, the company nonetheless received an unofficial shout-out from actor Daryl Sabara in the movie Spy Kids 2. Stafferoni explained that, as with many other celebrity sightings of Heelys, it just so happened that Sabara would wear them to the set and roll around and eventually they found their way into the film. They weren't really an integral part of the storyline, but they got onto the screen, so that was good. That series of fortuitous events ultimately resulted in the company posting $32 million in sales by the end of 2002. It had also grown to 700 employees. It saw a phenomenal year in Asia especially. The future looked bright. Working Towards Going Public In the five years since its inception in 2001, Healy's profit only increased continuously. The company did well enough that it even bought out Soaps, popular then for their grinding, a skateboard trick that fits in well with the Heelys approach of demonstrating exactly what their shoes should do. In terms of gross profit, to be more exact, in 2003 Heelys finished with a gross profit of $6.6 .6 million, in 2004 a profit of $6.8 million, in 2005 a profit of $15 million, and in 2006 a profit of $40.5 million. In three short years, Healy made more than quadruple its income. Only Vans came out ahead of Healy's in the skateboard footwear space. Healy's was absolutely on a roll and wanted to get even more in on the skateboarding culture. With the desire to expand its hold in the skating world, the company decided it needed even more capital to push further and faster. Going public in 2006, Healy's sparked a very positive valuation of $460 million or 19.5 times its annualized earnings. That optimistic valuation actually proved to be more of a burden than a blessing for Heelys. 
Stefferoni aptly summed his Healy's experience as seven great years and six really difficult months. The IPO, as he put it, was the beginning of the six months. With pretty much only one product offering and a core audience of young people with fickle tastes, Healy's went public because it recognized that problem. But over leveraging itself in an attempt to fix that problem would make things go downhill quickly. Beginning of the end The sudden influx of free floating cash marked the beginning of Healy's decline, as this also made Capital Southwest take notice and begin to get more involved in the day to day operations of Healy's. Unfortunately, while Capital Southwest might have been very savvy at investing in businesses, they didn't have the go-to-market experience in retail shoe business that was required to make Healy specifically get to the next level. At the same time, Roger Adams, who reportedly made $26.3 million and then disappeared, either having become satisfied with his newfound fortune or simply been given the boot from the increasingly corporate-like company. On top of all that, there was an increasing amount of public complaints about Healy's safety. So much so that malls and schools banned them and lawsuits piled up. In addition to that, the faddish aspect of Healy's was now coming back to haunt it. The same hype from kids who drove Healy's growth soon died down because they were teenagers now who thought the shoes were juvenile. In 2007, Healy's leadership, apart from Stafferoni, wanted to continue the commercial momentum by expanding its marketing to pretty much everyone. The company didn't want to leave any stone unturned as it sold more and more pairs of basically one shoe type. The executives at Healy seemed to want to sell until they dropped. Stafferoni was aghast and recounted that the executives would say, why wouldn't we just keep selling them? We're making a lot of money. He observed that they believed we were selling ourselves short by not marketing to everyone, not just kids, but teens, adults, parents, grandmas, grandpas. Everyone should be a target for Healy's, even dogs. No, I just added that last one. While the need to push upward and onwards to increase sales is understandable, it also dilutes the brand credibility. Young boys liked the brand because it seemed niche to their subculture. As Stafferoni put it, no self-respecting 14-year-old boy is going to want the product if there's a 6-year-old girl wearing them in the ads. Perhaps Healy should have focused more on creating different products for their core audience rather than trying to make everyone their core audience. It all comes tumbling down. Within five months of Healy's going public, the stock halved in one day and continued to freefall. As a sign that even leadership doubted where the company was going, in 2008, its CEO since its founding, Stafferoni, left the company after selling all his stock for about $4 million. In 2008 and 2009, Healy's board allegedly rejected buyout offers from Skechers USA Inc., a company that faced an equal amount of pressure by being too blasé about its stylings and the diversity of products. Since that time, Healy's has made many attempts at getting back to the height of its popularity, releasing shoes for boys and girls, men and women alike. However, while the company is still in business, COVID hasn't helped. Its parent company, Sequential Brands Group, reported last year that they were struggling financially themselves and would not be able to pay off its debt. Perhaps just as importantly as financials though, Healy's has become a pop cultural joke. It's largely a has-been item that was once trendy and important, but now has faded into semi-obscurity. Despite its decline, though, it's still amazing that Adams managed to change his life completely by acting on a spur-of-the-moment idea. Adams reportedly enjoys his life near Lake Tahoe these days and is living a comfortable life by taking action to, as he put it, follow your dreams and roll the dice. There are plenty of doors that are shut, find a way to open one. While it's easier said than done, his final advice to entrepreneurs still stands today. If I'd listened to the many people saying, no, you can't do this, I'd never have gotten off square one. Winning once can often be enough to change your life for the better, and Adams managed to do it. He doesn't need to care anymore if Healy's is still popular or not. And that brings us to today. Healy's started the trend with other companies falling, even Segway with the Segway Drift, but none have been as popular as the originals. We'll see what happens in the future with new technology and innovation. So with that said, thank you so much for watching my video. There was a significant amount of research and production that went into making this video possible. As this is a brand new YouTube channel I just started this year, if you enjoy videos like this, please click the subscribe button and hit that notification bell. I respond to all comments. If you love learning about fads from the 90s and haven't seen already, check out my video on the rise of LA gear shoes or the rise and fall of true religion jeans. As always, stay happy and healthy and stay tuned for another episode of Company Insight next week.